Hello DevOps people, how is everyone? I hope you're doing great. Oh, this one. It's Friday, finally, and uh, yeah, so it's time for another round of Full Stack Live. Welcome to my live coding channel. Um, I'm Jochen, and I'm going to continue today um, uh, building a Docker deployment for my Twitch chat bot, which will require first to um, build the Redis support in my underlying bot library. Um, when did I last uh, work on this? This was on Wednesday, I think. And um, I struggled to deploy my bot because I didn't quite get how to deploy work in progress on both the bot application and the bot library, aka Ruby gem, um, when the code hasn't been released yet to Ruby gems because it's not ready for release. So it was a bit of a catch-22. In order to um, release my code, I need to test it and see it working. And um, so I need to run it in Docker. However, the Docker build phase requires the gem to be released. So that was a bit of a, of a mystery for a while until the coin finally dropped. And uh, I realized, um, I need to avoid the dependency between my bot application and the gem by simply not uh, using the test application or the bot application as a test bed. That's what, what a test suite is for. Um, and by working solely in the gem project, building out tests, maybe even including a small example script, how to build a, an, an actual bot with it, um, I'll be able to um, resolve this issue, this catch-22. Um, I can run locally, um, maybe with uh, the database that I'm going to need running in a single uh, Docker container, and I'll be able to access the the container by uh, mapping an, a port to Redis. And that way I'll be able to work on my library. And as soon as that's ready for release, I can release it, bump the uh, dependency in my actual bot application, pull down the um, new library release, and then start working on the actual bot. So I guess I can simplify my development environment a bit because I'm not going to need both the Twitch bot project and my 10x project in the same workspace since I'm not since I'm going to stop hopping between these two projects. For a while, I'm going to work in the Twitch bot gem project, and only when that's uh, when when I've cut a new release for that, then I'm going to switch to the 10x project. Speaking of 10x, uh, the bot is should be at least running in chat. Uh, at the moment, and so should you, if you have any questions, if there's anything that you'd like me to explain, that's what I'm here for, so don't hold back. Uh, if there's anything that you'd like to share, or uh, if there is a, a question outside of uh, Ruby coding, maybe it's about uh, IT careers, it, maybe it's about um, the um, development interview process, anything that you'd like to ask me, I'm happy to chat about. Um, there aren't any stupid questions. So, yeah, uh, let's make this thing interactive. As a side note, I really uh, am looking forward to the uh, weekend and I feel a little bit spent today, so I'm not going, and I'm not sure uh, how long my batteries will hold up. 
but uh, let's see how long they are going to carry me. So, what now? I guess it's time to make sure that uh, the current implementation where memory is uh, ephemeral memory in the form of a hash does work. And maybe I should actually um, make this a subclass of memory, so memory hash, and we could add another class memory redis or other options that people might want to use. Uh, that way they'll have the choice of uh, supplying their bot with different forms of memory. Maybe even a disk file, even though I'm not the greatest fan of disk files because uh, uh, that's not very cloud native. Um, most um, cloud platforms don't offer persistent file storage by default. So um, that's a solution that I try to avoid. But of course, uh, especially if you are running the bot locally, that's not, not an issue at all. And uh, strangely enough, Solograph doesn't run the language server that VS Code uses for Ruby coding. And that's could not find Nokogiri in any of the sources. That's strange. And let me see if I can work around that or resolve that even. Uh, what I'm going to do, I think, since I'm going to focus on a single project, I'll actually remove the Twitch bot project from this workspace. And then I'll create a new window. Open the Twitch bot project here. Okay. Let's move the terminal to the right. See if that works. So here's the memory class again. Nope, same issue. So maybe we'll have to include solar graph in the gem file or the gem spec. Actually, it's in there. So bundle install should actually resolve that issue. Oh yes, there isn't any Nokogiri yet. Interesting. But I had a few Ruby environment issues lately, so that might be the cause. Oh, hey, Julian, welcome to Full Stack Live. How's your Friday going so far? Let's save this workspace. In my projects as Twitch bot workspace. So, can I try again? Maybe it's best if I reopen this uh, workspace. Let's 
starting. Uh, this time it was successful. Okay. So, let me think. We are still in our feature branch, 16 memory. And I wonder if there are any tests from memory. Yes, there are. So running break test should at least give us some response. Yeah, works. Nice. So yeah, let's let's uh, split this up. So we'll have a bot memory folder. And we'll rename this here to memory hash. That should still have the same result, but it does not. Of course it does not, because if we introduce new classes, we need to include them here as well. Where do we have that? That's memory hash with a slash, hash with a slash. Yeah, that's the level we are going to make jokes today. Still can't work because um, it's memory hash, of course. Oh, we are even using the memory already here in our client. That's not going to work. If we make memory um, something configurable, we need to make this part of the system configuration. So we need something similar to the adapter. So that's going to be a memory class, config setting memory. And by default, we're going to use memory hash that will have no dependencies. And then we'll assign, well, we can simply take this from above and say, Memory, object cons get memory class, new, no arguments needed. Peter, welcome. Welcome back to Full Stack Live. Nice to see you. Oh, I, of course he did. Of course he did. One Pocket Pimp is back and he already spotted the new feature. Ah, I built it just for you, only for you. That's how much I love you. Okay, so let's, oh dear, 12, yeah, okay. And that's why I've limited the use of, of, the, of this uh, uh, reward. 
Um, let me finish this, and then I will find a good place to, to place a, a, a comment. Uh, is this going to work? We have an issue with our initializer. I, <laughs> I was only waiting for that because the, the constructor here got longer and longer. But first, uh, thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, I enjoy uh, seeing this progress as well, uh, especially uh, with the design now taking shape and uh, we, ha we, we get more modular with our um, protocol adapters and our memory or storage classes. Um, that's how I'd like to, this thing to, to, to grow and to still stay maintainable. Um, in order to keep this uh, constructor here maintainable, I guess we'll, we'll have to factor a few things out. So I guess the, the logging um, the logging setup, for example, could be uh, extracted into something like uh, setup logging and uh, we are pretty much self-contained here uh, so I simply grab that and move it into a private method here Oof, can't write today. Uh, that already did resolve the issue. All the squiggly lines have disappeared. So Rubocop should be happy now. And I'll switch to running RSpec alone anyway. Ooh, OPP needed to leave. Still on uh, work time, apparently. But still, um, I owe him a comment. And I owe myself a sip of coffee. Oh, I know. I know. It'll be even be more than a comment. Um, because I want to also provide my users with uh, API documentation, it's time we start using Yard. Um, because Yard is the most common documentation uh, tool for, for Ruby gems. And uh, so it's time to add a few comment blocks in front of my public methods here. Uh, that way I can actually weather OPP's 12 comment pipeline that's coming up. Um, maybe I need to make this reward more expensive. I'll use the yard extension here, but I'll have to look up how this actually works. I've never used it before. I have used Yard, but not the Yard Documenter extension for VS Code. Position cursor on a definition you wish to comment, and then hit Option Command Enter. Not sure if that's going to work, but uh, I guess there's a command from the command palette as well. Uh, if the hotkey doesn't work, then we'll do it that way. So, uh, Option Command Enter. Seems like a very common... Ha! Huh, look at that. It did work. Even though it's a very common hotkey combination. Fine with me. Uh, description is... Well, it might not work ideally with the Vim extension, though. Let's, let's see. Uh, register an event handler for a for specific event types. Yeah, I think it's supposed to tap through these things, but uh, it, it's not going to. No worries. Uh, so we call this handler. Oh no, it's a uh, 
it's an event handler class. Event handler handler. And what do we return? We do don't return anything, I guess. <laughs> so I guess we'll just remove this. Okay. So that is fine. So previously we committed split up CI jobs for test and release. And here we have the ephemeral memory feature. Okay. I guess I'll, I'll then merge this into this previous commit here. I can do that by rebasing my current branch. I haven't tried Sorbet yet. It's uh, definitely interesting. Um, I do appreciate the value of um, type languages. So just for context, uh, Sorbet is a Ruby gem um, that uh, has been developed at Stripe. And um, Sorbet allows you to basically introduce types into your Ruby code. Uh, so it's an uh, it's a type checker that uh, works on top of, of uh, standard Ruby. And um, yeah, I, I'd be curious how, how uh, to work with a typed Ruby dialect. Actually, this project could be an, an interesting use case for, for uh, Sorbet um, because it's built from scratch and I have complete control and it's not as big as say a, a Rails project where um, 80% of your code um, comes from external third-party libraries. Um, that could be an interesting thing to explore eventually, how to introduce types into this code. Nice idea. Let's write that down. I agree. If it's if it's not uh, added as an afterthought, it's it's probably more robust, more mature, um, and Crystal does actually provide that. That's one of the reasons Crystal was created because uh, it has the syntax and language philosophy of Ruby, but in a typed way. Okay, so yeah, let's commit this. Why are there so many changes to different files? Oh yeah, I've mostly removed stuff and uh, yeah, okay. I'll just do a quick quick commit because this commit is not going to be long lived. Uh, because the next thing I'm going to do is git rebase upstream, which is going to do a git fetch, um, then compare my branch with the master branch um, and uh, 
then allow me to rebase my changes on the master branch. And I'll actually put the CI thing to the top because that's completely unrelated to the actual thing I'm working on and then memory improvements will be added as a fix up to the previous commit. Let's see if things still work. They do. I guess that means we can actually release this. Huh. That's another uh, interesting realization. Um, at least it's interesting for me. Um, I am still not uh, at my goal where I have persistent memory for my bot. Uh, current, the current memory hash class is built on a hash that will uh, lose all its uh, memory when I stop the bot. However, um, all the uh, groundwork is there, uh, the foundational stuff, and why not release this? Um, this I'm, I'm very much a friend of uh, release often, and make quick short-lived cha changes and then build upon them. Use feature flags to introduce stuff that can't be used yet, um, but is going to be important for the stuff that comes next. Um, things like that. And actually, um, that will also uh, help me with the, with the development cycle that I've described earlier, where I need to switch between my application project and my library project. And um, so, for example, now I can actually um, start building an event handler that does something with, with memory. Um, but, um, of course, uh, knowing full well that uh, this memory will be ephemeral. So, uh, and later we can simply uh, switch out our memory class to something more persistent, and uh, my uh, existing code will still work, just with a longer-lived memory. So yeah, let's do this. Um, let's actually make a proper release here. So what we're going to do is bump the gem version I guess it's going to be a minor jump because we don't have any breaking changes uh, so I don't have to uh, bump the major version in the uh, uh, philosophy of semantic versioning it's also not a patch where uh, you only make internal changes and improvements without changing functionality so it's exactly in the middle um, and we're bumping the minor version here. 3.2.0 needs now to be documented. Oh, 3.1.0 uh, is already our new version, obviously. Um, so uh, let me fix that. Actually, we can simply... Nope. We can actually revert this. So we are at version 3.1.0. That's that. Let's close everything just to be sure we don't have anything left to commit. Then we can do a rake install. Now we have our client library uh, locally and um, now I can actually push this to github where we can actually create a, a pull request Uh, it's not so persistent, but at least, uh, well, let's let's be honest and this change introduces 
memory a way to store data dynamically at the moment we only offer a offer storage based on hash that will be lost when the bot exits. I assign myself. And I've uh, configured GitHub Actions to run my test suite here. So I can actually tell if my code is ready to merge or maybe I have forgotten to run my test suite locally and uh, missed a few bugs. So now I'll wait until GitHub Actions has actually tested my code. And then we can merge this pull request. Even if I'm working not in a team but by myself, I have this workflow where I do a pull request for these changes and um, so I can actually see a history of changes and uh, don't have to merge directly into master. On the other hand, if I then merge this to master, I can um, tag the new version in the master branch, which will um, make GitHub Actions release the gem to Ruby gems automatically. So I don't have to do that manually anymore. I just have to add a new tag. So, um, oi, Julian, um, how big is the project that you've been using Crystal with? I'd be curious how um, big the uh, performance difference is between MRI, Ruby and, and Crystal, for example. All checks have passed, both for the push and for the pull request. I don't know. Ah, yeah, okay, release doesn't apply here. So um, they were skipped. And one minute is pretty fast. That's that's nice. Okay, so yeah, let's merge this. Now pull the changes. Remove the feature branch and tag this git tag v three one oh Okay, so you've, you've tested it a bit. I don't remember, is Crystal a compiler that spits out a binary at the end? Or what's the, the advantage Crystal has here? Why is it so much uh, faster than, than uh, normal Ruby? Alrighty, that was the tag. Let's take a look at what GitHub Actions does, because I think that's the first tag I've been using. Yeah, I haven't used tags before. Let's see if it actually successfully releases our gem. Native executable. Okay, so it really creates a binary that you can run. Nice. <sighs> 
test is running. And run successfully. Let's see if release is successful as well. Oh, that failed. Look at that. Set R spec is unavailable. Okay, it tries to run rake release and it doesn't have R spec available. Okay. I guess we missed installing the whole bundler thingy, huh? I guess I'll split that up because I did miss that because um, the bundle install is uh, mixed into um, running the actual test suite here. So I guess I'll introduce a separate step here, bundle, which is going to run in my Why is that a separate, a different color than down here? Huh? Oh, that's just not a slash. Okay, it's a pipe symbol, but uh, VS Code displays it in italic. That uh, confused me for a bit. So we'll run uh, Bundler here, and then we'll run the test, and in the same way we're going to run Bundler here, and then publish to Ruby Gems. Fine, let's give this another try. Fix GitHub release action. I'll push this. Then I'll have to re tag this. How do I remove the tag again? It's tag dash D git tag dash dv v one o git tag v three one o git push origin let's first re uh, remove the old tag and then we'll push the new tag And while this is running, I need to take a quick break and I'll be right back.
I mean, if it's if there's one thing that I've learned from the recent Life Coders conference, then uh, it is that how important it is to drink water. Speaking of Life Coders conference, by the way, uh, there's no, a new Life Coders conference coming up already. If I can actually launch my picture. No, oh, that's wrong. Well, yeah, whatever. So, June 20th. Save the date. There's going to be our summer conference. For more information, visit conf.lifecoders.dev. There's not much there yet because uh, we are already in the preparation phase, so the, nothing's uh, set in stone yet. But uh, yeah, there's going to be another conference and um, I'll definitely um, submit a new talk proposal as well. Okay, we have another failure. Fail, fail, fail. What is it this time? Ah, crap. Okay. Yeah, I think I've just recently enabled multi-factor authentication at Ruby Gems, and uh, them asking for an OTP code here throws a wrench into things uh, quite a bit. Ah, uh, crap. Okay. So how is this supposed to work? I guess we'll have to find out, otherwise I won't be able to release my, my gem properly. Well, I can always run a rake release locally, of course, but that's exactly what I'm not going to do in the future, because I um, I uh, rely on having continuous integration in place so much. It's so convenient and uh, provides such a more robust process to things. Uh, of course, uh, having a test suite is the most important thing, and it's basically the, the prereq prerequisite for having a CI continuous integration system in place. But, um, for example, um, uh, always having to manually release a gem will certainly uh, eventually lead to me um, pushing stuff to GitHub without uh, running a release, and then uh, people don't get the, the latest uh, gem version from Ruby Gems and things like that. So, yeah. Yes, One Pocket Pimp, there is going to be another Live Coders conference, another day-long series of uh, talks. I have to, still have to watch a few that I missed because it was getting far too late for me. Uh, I tried to, to stay as long as possible and to so support my fellow Live Coders, but in the end I still had to miss a few because uh, it was time for me to go to bed. It was two or three in the morning. Okay, so um, what am I going to do? Uh, I guess I'll release this gem locally. And uh, I'll... Okay, now I have to enter OTP code. So uh, yeah, I'll do that behind closed curtains. Uh, where is my OTP? I want my... I want my, I want my OTP. Yeah, not not quitting my day job. The videos uh, for, of the Live Coders Twitch um, conference have been well. You can watch the vods on on Twitch. I'm pretty sure they, they've been marked as highlights, so they stood stay, should stay around. However, um, uh, we are also releasing them one by one on our um, Live Coders YouTube channel. Just let me finish this here quickly. Nice. Okay, that's released. Um, So let me find the channel name, or maybe we can find it by searching youtube.com. Uh, yes, yes, of course. 
I agree. I agree to everything. I'm not locked into YouTube, so there's lots of strange content here. I don't care. Live coders. Uh, the live coders. Here it is. So simply search for the live coders. And uh, the first three talks have been uploaded, I guess. No, even a few more, including mine. Okay, so 310 is released. So let me use that in my bot. So Twitch bot three one is now required. Did we get it? Don't doesn't seem like it. Why wait, 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 why? Oh, I did use it. Uh, I already had switched to the three one. Where is it? Which part? Yeah, because of local stuff that I've already done here. Uh, yes, we are already on three one zero, so it's going to use the newest uh, version that I've installed locally. And we'll have to make a few changes, or do we? Um, I made changes to the plan command handler that let me set my project or plan um, dynamically in chat. I guess simply running rake test will, sh test will show if uh, things still work. Yes, they do. Okay. I guess it's time to test it in production. Oh, well, let's let's test it in in development first. Uh, I don't have uh, set bot mode, so export bot mode development. Empty plan. Maybe we should uh, also have an output uh, when when there is no plan. So I should be able to run plan set. This is a test. And if I do... Oh, see, that did not work. I get a permission denied here. Because... Um, the terminal chat does not recognize me as the owner of this chat channel. That's a small bug in the terminal mode here. Or maybe a, a, a small bug in... Well, the authentication or authorization here is pretty simplistic because all I do in the command handler is I actually check if uh, the uh, message comes from the uh, user with the channel name. So I guess the uh, terminal should always use the channel name as the uh, event. Well, we can fix that right away. No, we can't. Uh, that's in the other project. So let's fi actually file a bug. Again, this might seem like overkill, but um, having a standard way to operate uh, really simplifies things. And uh, that way I also don't have to rely on my very leaky memory. So, um, yeah, um, 
terminal adapter doesn't send messages from channel owner. The most simple way of authorization is to check if a message comes from the user with the channel's name. However, the terminal adapter for dev mode does not behave like that. So that's definitely kind of a bug. I don't think there's a quick workaround here, so I'll actually rely on my or uh, trust in my code and uh, run this locally or in production rather. So let's go into the running bot. Stop that. And we'll run the new version. There it is. Let's make sure we have a plan. Plan set. Let's give 10x a memory. Feel free to test if bang plan actually responds correctly. Definitely should. And uh, okay. I'll amend these changes into the existing commit here. It's basically just the updated version here. So that's just a single commit. You know what, in this case I'm not going to do a merge request because uh, this project is basically my pet project for my own. So 
So I merge that right away. Okay. So I guess now it's time to switch back to the bot project and implement a persistent memory. And then we can return to... No, um, what I meant was um, switch to the library project, uh, implement the persistent memory, and then switch back to this project and um, simply switch our memory class to something persistent. And um, that way um, we can survive stopping the bot. So, back to the library we go. And, uh, well, oh, I forgot that I had to close this. I'm a bit spoiled by GitLab because they automatically close or they automatically add a reference to close the um, related issue for a branch that gets merged, uh, but uh, GitHub doesn't do that, at least not by default. I don't know if there's a way to actually make GitHub do that, but I also have to, I always have to remember um, to actually do this. Uh, which commit was this? I guess that's the commit. No, oh, no. That's wrong. 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 That's better. Um, which means I need to have a new issue because I very I interpreted memory a bit loosely here. Um, so memory is not persistent. With memory hash, we lose all stored data when the bot exits. There needs to be a persistent alternative. I assign myself right away, and that's definitely an enhancement. Do we actually have milestones yet? No, there's no milestone. Okay, we don't uh, need them right now. Mm, I guess. Let's check out branch 23, memory persistent. <laughs> and I think, oops, we need to use uh, dash B here. So I think that um, using Redis will be a good alternative to using a hash because um, the interface is pretty similar. You simply store keys and values related to each key. And um, it's only a single value, just like with hash. However, of course, this value can be um, uh, a string. And so we could use, for example, a JSON document um, as the value, as we can with the hash memory as well. Hash memory would even be 
uh, superior in, in uh, the uh, spectrum of stuff we can store. Um, with radius we'll be limited to string values, but um, uh, on the plus side these strings can be very long. And I think um, having being able to uh, simply have maybe a key per plugin or extension or something like that, so the plan uh, command would have its own key named plan um, and uh, then we'll simply store JSON stuff be beyond that and uh, update it if uh, need be. Uh, I think that's uh, going to be sufficient and uh, so what I'm going to do is actually rely on, on Redis for my persistent memory. Which means we are going to build a test. Redis spec.rb. And we'll go ahead and copy this test here. and use this for test-driven development. So let's run regspec. Of course, we can't use this um, um, class yet because it doesn't exist yet. So let's go step by step and fix this. So if the actual error is there is a constant a constant that needs to be defined, well, we can do that. I could actually define a constant, but that would be a little bit ridiculous. So um, I'll create a new file, redis.rb, with the usual frozen string shebang. And then it's going to be module twitch module bot module memory class radius. Oh, we need an end, don't we? Come on. So that's valid Ruby, even though the class is completely empty, and that should resolve the uninitialized constant error. Of course, it'll just be followed up with the next. Oh, I need to... I wonder how many classes I'll have to introduce before I remember adding them. Uh... So now we have an undefined method store. Of course, we can remediate that by adding a store method. And uh, obviously, the retrieve method needs to be implemented as well. And unfortunately, um, either store or retrieve don't work. Uh, actually, they both don't work. So now I'll have to stop stalling and start adding Redis support to my gem. So there's a Ruby guides page on that. Maybe let's consult that first. Yeah, we need a Redis server. Wait, what? A Redis server. We could use brew install Redis, but um, I prefer to running stuff not locally on my machine because that just pollutes uh, the file system. Instead, I'm going to uh, run stuff in Docker. Let's make sure Docker is actually available. It is. So I guess uh, we'll do a Docker run. Uh, 
Uh, I'll have to look it up. Docker pub radius. Okay. And then we'll need a port mapping. I do run other Redis instances. So how do we go about this the best way? I could start using Docker Compose. That would probably be a good step. Let's run Redis first, and then we'll find out what else we need. So I'll do a Docker run. Docker run name bot Redis. Dash T Redis. I guess I'll need some kind of port mapping here. I'm still struggling to pronounce your name. Hi. <laughs> yes, of course. Please go ahead and ask. That's what I'm here for. Why wanna kill me? Okay. Jeez, even on a Friday afternoon, I figured that out. Even though my brain feels a bit fried now. It's past five. You've been reading books by DHH? Yep. Author of Ruby, of Ruby on Rails, of course, yes. I like the book, so I thought, why not learn Ruby as well? Maybe it's a cool language. It definitely is. <laughs> I, con I can confirm that. Yes, I do. Uh, uh, misremember the command. Uh, let me see. Uh, pretty sure I added a command for a few. Huh. Really? I thought I had created a, a chat com bot command pointing out to a few projects. No, I haven't. Okay, so um, let's um, pull up my notes for my Ruby beginners course on which I started working but it's still pretty much in the inception phase 
However, here you have quite a few um, links to which I can point you. So let me post them into chat. So there's Jumpstart Lab. The Odin project is definitely a nice resource. Code Academy has a Ruby course. Then there's Josh Cheek, who offers something. Exorcism uh, has uh, practice examples for Ruby. So these are just a few that should you should get you on your way. I'm definitely a fan of uh, DHH as well, both uh, from a coder's perspective as from a business owner's perspective. I'm pretty sure I have uh, almost all of his books uh, on, on running businesses. So uh, he, he authored uh, quite a few books with, together with his um, co-CEO, uh, uh, Jason Fried. Uh, so I've read um, uh, Remote on uh, building a distributed business. I read um, the their latest, uh, well, you could call it a book uh, on um, uh, Shape Up. And then there's the one about um, building a business with a proper culture. That's, um, uh, what what's it called? Let me see. I haven't read It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work, but I've definitely read Rework. That's the book I was looking for. Rework is a great business book. Uh, on company culture and focusing on, on the important things. Uh, it doesn't have to be crazy at work. It's pretty much the sequel to this book. And then there's Shape Up. That you can um, download directly from their website. Um, so basecamp.com and Shape Up. Where is it? Here. That's how they run projects. Justin Weiss, I think, uh, writes about uh, leadership, doesn't he? Um, I think I've read stuff from him uh, as well. So Shape Up is about how Basecamp themselves run projects and um, release stuff, actually ship projects and uh, features. Uh, it's also a very interesting read. Um, it's definitely based on using Basecamp. However, um, they have a lot of um, put a lot of thought into what is important and what's not. And for example, they've decided not to do sprints or uh, similar agile stuff. Um, and I think uh, uh, it's a lot of uh, great food for thought. And I agree with Ohe Julian. Uh, taking a look at the actual code of um, well-built Ruby projects definitely uh, helps getting a feel for the language. And that pretty much brings me back to my own project here because um, that's the goal of my Twitch, Twitch chatbot project to implement um, something fun in a way that um, is exemplary in terms of code design, object-oriented structure, and things like that. So, still not found out how to properly um, map my port. Uh, Redis? Well, let's, let's start it like this way and find out. Um, so here's our Redis container. And it has port 6379. 
we could actually expose that. Directly on my host here. Let's expose it uh, on port 16379. That way I can make sure that uh, we don't clash with anything else. I don't have anything running on this port. Somehow I'm reluctant to use the official port. Should I? Should I be reluctant? Or should I embrace that and uh, tear down a test container as soon as I need a Redis elsewhere? Still, that might still mess up the wrong Redis instance, I guess. That's pretty much why I use Docker Compose, to be honest. Yeah, let's let's use Docker Compose here. So, do we have a Docker Compose file already? Nope, not yet. But I think we have one in the bot project. Yes, we do. And here we basically need Redis. Yeah, here we go. So we can actually docker kill. Nope. Docker kill this ID. Docker RM this ID. So let's use this and let's actually expose it to 6379. So docker compose port. Maybe I should search for this. Expose ports without publishing them to the host machine. They'll only be accessed, accessible to linked services. We are not yet running our bot in, itself in, in Docker. So we'll actually have to not only expose it, but also map it. And that's done with the colon. Okay, so it's ports. And then it's six three seven nine two six three seven nine. So I can run DC up, Docker Compose up. Uh, let's run this in a separate terminal. So Redis is starting, ready to accept connections, and uh, it should be properly mapped to my host here. So we can actually try that with the telnet localhost 6379. Yeah, we can connect. Let's uh, quit telnet again. And now, Let's continue with uh, implementing Redis support in our library here. We'll need the Redis RB gem. Oh, it's just Redis. Gem is not Redis, so let's go to our gem spec. don't have any official dependency yet so that's going to be our new uh, or our first and uh, dependency redis bundle install let's pin the version 413 so we'll rely on 41 
hoping that they follow semantic versioning as well. And now I can require Redis, create a new Redis instance. That's going to happen in the initializer of our Redis memory class. And then we can use Redis set and Redis get as our key value store. And that should do it, I guess. So um, let's try. No. Require Redis. Uh, then we'll need to have that in our constructor. I guess Redis is going to be a private attribute. So we can actually make this an instance variable. We'll change this and this. And then it's Redis set and Redis get. So Redis set key value Redis get key. And that's it. And uh, one pocket pimp here's a comment for free. Implement persistent memory based on Redis. So, let's see if this is gonna happen. Nope, it's not. Wrong number of arguments. In where, where? Line 10, initialize. Oh yeah, uh, how do we... Huh? We don't have any argument. Given one expected zero, yeah, why... Uh, wait, what? Red is new. Doesn't expect a, an argument. Did they change their interface? Let's find out. Probably should have used the, or, yeah, uh, the uh, official documentation from the start. Uh, no, but there's host and port and stuff, so. It's host? Yeah, there. That's it. Am I missing something here? Maybe it's in Redis spec. No, we... Hmm? What am I missing? Redis, new, host, port, database. Wrong number of arguments given one expected zero. So initialize. Pot memory redis. Twitch pot memory redis. Twitch pot memory hash. Initialize. 
Let's add the missing comment here just to get rid of this uh, small squiggly line here. Um, implement a an ephemeral memory using using a hash. Oh, I see. We have a namespace issue here. Uh, I'm referring to Redis, in turn referencing myself, and that's not exactly what uh, I need here. Here we go! Redis does work! However, uh, we need a way to actually supply our chatbot client with the memory class we want to use. So, oh yeah, that, that uh, happens in the configuration file. Okay. I guess uh, that's everything we need. So you see, proper design really helps shape your coding work here. I already had designed the whole interface using a hash, and of course, um, thanks to Redis being very simple to access, um, the implementation here is almost uh, less complex than actually the, the hash implementation. Uh, we on, uh, only delegate to Redis here, but uh, that's all we need to have persistent memory. Uh, on, and of course, we need to run Redis in a persistent mode. Um, so that's something that I'll have to figure out. Yo, what's going on? And we'll probably have to make this... Uh, configurable exactly we need to be able to tell our library to use a, a bot uh, a redis instance on on a different host and things like that so um yeah you're perfectly right here and that requires us to actually link the client with its configuration to the memory class uh, just as we did with the adapter so here in the, say, the IRC adapter, we initialize this class from the client class and we pass in uh, the, client cl uh, the client object itself. And uh, we'll do the same with our memory class, which is not yet becoming a breaking change, I guess. because so far there wasn't any choice and uh, at least if you rely on the default implementation you didn't have to pass in a client but we'll do that now so we'll have the client and the key value store
uh, uh, how do we did we implement the configuration? Yes, uh, we actually simply provide the configuration object with a hash. Uh, so at the moment, my my bot script um, simply creates this hash and passes it in. Um, it's basically hard coded. However, of course, it'll be easy from to to uh, make your bot script read a, a YAML file or a JSON file and read that as a hash and then pass in the hash. Uh, to the config object. Um, I can show you that in a second when we've actually implemented the uh, interface and by using the client object we can get to the configuration object that will provide us with all, all the information we, we need. So um, in this case we have to initialize it with client even though we are not going to use that. Uh, but we'll need to keep the interface consistent and in this case we'll actually um, need to pass that in in order to get the configuration data and uh, so that's that and let's go ahead and split this into its own method def uh, Connect DB and we'll use um, Post equals client config redis host or localhost. Do you think it's a good idea to implement the configure pattern? I'll have a look at that. You want to kill me? So my internet decided to stop working for a while. I had to rewatch the answer about Ruby and books now. Thanks for the information. Once again, yes, you're very welcome. And uh, please don't hold back. If you have any more questions, if there's anything um, uh, that uh, uh, you encounter while uh, trying out Ruby, um, either pop by if uh, I'm online here on my stream or simply pop into Discord where you can reach me anytime and uh, there's a Ruby channel on my Discord server where we can uh, discuss any questions you might have and I'll be more than happy to answer them. Uh, now let's take a look at this uh, configure thingy. Uh, da, 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 da. Can I pull this tab over here? I can't because it comes from a different profile. So let's try and open it again. Ah, oh, come on. I have to copy. I guess it's a mygem.configure my block. Here's the implementation. So it uses a class method configuration. Uh, a class uh, attribute. And then it has a class method configure where it stores the configuration. No, where it returns the configuration or it creates a new. No, oh, ah, I see. It makes sure there is a configuration object. Okay. 
and then it yields this configuration. And in configuration, we have the different settings. In this case, mailer sender. The configure class method stores a configuration object inside the clearance module. Anything set from the configure block is an attribute of the configuration class. Lone Wolf, welcome, welcome, welcome to Full Stack Live. How are you doing on this nice Friday afternoon? So now config initializes clearance RB. Is possible clearance configure to config? Or there, there it yields the configuration class in config. That's a level of uh, how's it called a, lo a level of meta programming that uh, I'm not yet fluent in. I'll be honest. You're pretty good. Looking forward to relaxing this weekend after a tough week at work. Uh, <laughs> thank Thor. It's Friday, huh? I'm doing excellent. Uh, a bit tired myself, but uh, I had a quite relaxed week, so I don't complain. Um, and um, yeah, and also having a lot of fun with this uh, Twitch chatbot project because I'm learning a lot. And uh, at the moment, you see me see my learning process uh, working. So um, we have this configuration class that has accessors. Uh, where these uh, attributes or accessors get uh, defined. And it's this configure method, this class method that uh, stumps me a bit. So we initialize the configuration class attribute and then we'll yield. Okay, yeah, we run the block where we yield configuration, which is this configuration object, to the block. And it appears as the config parameter in here, where I can actually say configuration mailer sender of course yeah and it's not a an uh, at a reader it's an actual accessor so it's uh, writable okay yes i like that i do like that So what I'm going to do is the same thing as I always do. I create a new issue. Configuration is Well, the issue, it's not really an issue. It's its more of a, uh, something that, uh, it's more about elegance here, I guess. Um, configuration could be. Well, simplified isn't also the, isn't either the, the issue here. Configuration could be.
see Thoughtbot. I love the folks at Thoughtbot. Um, maybe if I keep reading. We recently enhanced clearance with configuring and convenience. I liked the way I break it and wanted it in the same pattern. Yeah, there's not much of a uh, of reasoning here of an argument, um, but uh, yeah, having this configure block is definitely quite elegant. And yeah, okay. So one argument we have here is that these things here um, are official methods uh, because they are accessors. And um, at the moment, I'm simply passing in a hash. Um, so there could be typos. I could include stuff in this hash that's not even... Uh, uh, hey, the bot works. Um, it's not even... Uh, uh, that's not even uh, used. So uh, this will make configuration errors um, less likely, or it'll catch configuration errors immediately. Um, configuration via hash uh, is error prone. So that's actually an issue here. And um, by implementing a, how did they call that? Configuration block. Using methods. See this, we can make the interface much more robust. So this is going to be an actual enhancement. By the way, welcome to Q78. Uh, welcome to Full Stack, Full Stack Life. How are things? Yeah, bike shed is is awesome. I've been listening to bike sh to the bike shed for for ages. I also listen to the uh, Ruby on Rails podcast, um, and um, then um, the author of the Go Rails Ruby videos uh, has his own podcast as well. Oh, I can explain why why it's called the bike shed. Um, um, yeah, uh, let me take a look at my podcast collection. So, the bike shed. After Grimm's the cash flush. Then there's Maintainable, that's more of a DevOps uh, podcast about technical debt and stuff like that. Then there's Remote Ruby, that's from Chris Oliver, the guy from uh, um, uh, Go Rails, which is, by the way, um, a, a video series. Um, it's uh, a paid series, however, I think it's, uh, it's uh, money well spent. GoRails.com, and then there's the Ruby on Rails podcast, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, and uh, even with uh, the, my current list of podcasts, I'm still way behind in listening. So why is it called the bike shed? There are two things in in coding uh, that will uh, eat up your time easily. Um, uh, one of them is in wait i don't have i i can't uh botch this let me quickly wait 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 Yeah, okay. Yeah, I 
I've, I've, I've changed my, my uh, uh, streaming setup a bit and uh, got myself a green screen and things like that, just to have a little bit more fun. Um, so yeah, uh, bike shedding is um, uh, it's referring to uh, Parkinson's law of tri triviality. Um, he, he used that as an example. Uh, for example, people who have to um, design the architecture of a nuclear power plant uh, might uh, find themselves uh, wasting a lot of time discussing the color of the staff bike shed instead of focusing on, on the important things. Um, so uh, uh, bike shedding is... Uh, when, when we lose uh, ourselves in discussing trivialities instead of uh, uh, looking at the things that actually matter about our project. So maybe if I would go into um, hour-long discussions with uh, Oh Hey Julian about if we should rather uh, use a hash for configuration or uh, the, the uh, uh, configuration code block um, instead of focusing on my main goal here, which is to uh, implement a Redis database for my bot, that you uh, would probably be called bike shedding. And the other thing is uh, yak shaving. And that's when uh, you actually spend a lot of time uh, implementing uh, trivialities. So let me look that up so I don't uh, misconstrue that. Yak shaving, which probably is going to take a long time. Okay, so that's uh, actually... Uh, okay, uh, so it's uh, more or less a useless activity because it's pretty useless to, to try and shave a yak with uh, the, uh, the growth a yak probably has in terms of hair. Coined by Carlin Vieri in his time at the MIT AI lab, after viewing a 1991 episode of The Ren and Stimpy Show featuring Yak Shaving Day, a Christmas-like holiday where participants hang diapers instead of stockings, stuff rubber boots with coleslaw, and watch for the shaven yak to float by in his enchanted canoe. I do not know what the people um, doing The Ren and Stimpy Show were using. Uh, but I'd pretty much want to get my hand on that. Okay, so... Um, brr, bum, bum. What's that colon colon redis notation? That's actually um, basically uh, telling Ruby to use the redis class at the root of our namespaces. So it's actually redis and not, as uh, it happened before I inserted the two columns, uh, using the Twitch bot memory Redis class, which is in the local namespace here. So we are going to the global namespace and saying, um, please use the top level Redis class instead of our own fourth level Redis class here. Yaks will die if you shave them in winter. Well, it depends, I guess, uh, if you shave them uh, in their native um, uh, habitat or um, if you shave them, for example, in your basement sauna. You feel you should learn Ruby a lot more to understand this code? Well, uh, that's exactly what this stream is for. So um, uh, I hope you, you learn a little bit by uh, accompanying me on this journey because um, I definitely am learning a lot here. Um, so, where were we? Uh, configuration block. So I have uh, created an issue for that and uh, that means we can... Oh, uh, I wanted to test this, if this works. Um, so we are trying to find a configuration key Redis host Otherwise, we'll simply use localhost. Um, since we don't have that uh, client configuration key yet, um, our uh, tests should run successfully still. However, they do not. 
missing keyword client. Wait, what? Oh yes, of course, we now need to um, pass the client here, of course. Um, so our client class needs to be changed. And we'll have to pass a client argument, namely ourselves. So just like with the adapter, we, we are passing ourselves into the memory class, making our own public methods available to memory. So memory can actually call client dot something. Less failures, but still two failures left. Missing keyword client still. Okay. That's probably in the test itself. Uh, yes. So here we need to pass in a client. That makes things a little bit more complex. So we'll steal a bit from the adapter tests. or even the client spec itself. Here we actually have to create a, a config. Okay. Not a fan. Not only do we have to create a configuration here, hmm. well, actually, we do not. I don't know if it's the cleanest thing, but uh, we can, we can, of course, um, create a new client here. Client equals uh, Twitch dot client new. What does a client need? Tell me client spec. It needs a config and a channel. So we could use an empty config. That could even be the default here, so we can lose that. Oh, that has to be a config class, I guess. So that's the downside of de dependency injection. In, 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 uh, in order to be able to pass in a client to my memory class, I need to create a client. In order to create a client, I need to have a configuration. And so uh, it's turtles all the way down. Um, this makes test setup really convoluted. I'm not sure how to work around that, but uh, I don't like it. I definitely do not like it. Channel test channel. We don't even have to have Redis related uh, config settings. Of course we could set them, but uh, it should work without that. Guess that might work actually. No. Connect DB.
client config redis host i guess uh, client config oh it's client config setting right yeah setting and then the name yeah, we'll have to change these interfaces to to be a bit let be a, a little bit less uh, complicated. Missing keyword client. Twitch bot memory hash store. So there's still one failure here where we need to pass in a client. But I think that can be nil actually. Can it? Yes, it can. Okay. So another thing is that, of course, we need to have a Redis instance running here uh, in order to even be even uh, be uh, uh, able to run these tests. And that's something that I also don't like. The question is, do we? mock redis in this case to make this test work if we mock redis we basically re-implement the the hash memory and we won't ever know if uh, our redis interface actually works with redis hmm these are questions that i'm Still not able to answer. However, with a running Redis instance in, in the background, uh, the tests actually are successful. And I guess if we have Redis related functionality, we probably need to run Redis here, actually. I mean, the folks developing action, um, active record also need to have the, the uh, respective database running for the, for the tests to, to work. Because of course they want to test if they can access Postgres or MyS MySQL or whatever. SQLite, so um, yeah, we might actually require Redis to develop and run tests here. Seems to be par for the course. Okay. That is nice. Of course, uh, we are still missing the port configuration. Uh, so let's uh, uh, use that as well. What port do we run on? 6379. So that's that. Should still work. Yes, I, I too uh, get confused. Uh, where to stop and mock things and uh, well uh, in terms of stopping and mocking it seems according to to rubocop uh, it seems to be preferable to use the actual classes and then stop and mock um, single methods or single behaviors of this class uh, using these um, test doubles um, seems not to be in fashion anymore um, because probably they are too far removed from the actual stuff that you're testing um, but still um, i get very uh, insecure when it comes to where to actually start stopping and uh, simulating and faking uh, behavior instead of using the real behavior just as like with this um, uh, was a bit insecure am i actually supposed to rely on a redis instance running here only to run the tests shouldn't i maybe um, 
stop the the Redis calls, but in order to get the tests uh, working, then I would have to stop the Redis calls with calls to a hash. So I would basically re-implement re my hash um, uh, class here. And uh, it wouldn't make any sense to have a test for the Redis class if, in fact, I am testing the, the hash class. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess I need to have a Redis instance running if I want to test the, the Redis memory class here. That's uh, my conclusion here. And of course, if you can avoid mocks and stops, then do it. So uh, that uh, probably explains why people prefer to run um, uh, the the real classes um, that you are testing and only stopping certain things that would otherwise prevent your tests from uh, actually running um, instead of um, building test doubles that are only a shadow of the original. What is stops and mocks? Well, um, let me uh, use an example here. Uh, here in my uh, config spec, no, I don't use any mocks here. Here, for example, I um, call client dispatch with a message. And then I expect the trigger method, which is misnamed. It's now called dispatch. I expect the client then to send a ping message. So I say expect client to have received sent data. And in order for that to work, uh, I need to stop the send data uh, method. So uh, RSpec can actually um, look into what's happening and uh, note if uh, send data is called. And that's why I allow client to receive send data, which replaces the original send data method with uh, um, fake instrumentation that then um, let's uh, uh, RSpec notice if send data is called. I think that's also called a spy if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. So we replace send data with a spy for RSpec that allows us to afterwards then test if send data has uh, actually been called. Or let's take this test here. So I pass in a message with the type mode where we add a moderator in the channel. I pass this message to dispatch. I expect the client to then um, receive an add moderator call. That's uh, what's uh, supposed to be happening here. The add moderator method is supposed to be called because we are sending a mode message that means there is an, a change in moderators. And uh, in order to check that we have received this add moderator call, um, we need to instrument it with a spy. Uh, that's done by allow client to receive a certain message and Ruby messages are method calls. So we basically say allow client to receive a message call for the uh, a method call for the method add moderator. Um, and that replaces the original add moderator method with uh, a spy from from our spec that simply makes a check mark on its uh, virtual notepad. I hope that uh, explained it a little bit. Exactly, Lone Wolf. Um, you use it when you just want to test that the method gets called and you're not interested in what the method actually does. 
Otherwise, you could write a simple test that exercises the method and checks what it returns. But um, here I'm testing the dispatch method that needs to result in add moderator to be called if I pass in this specific message, uh, in this case a mode message. Um, So what RSpec does in the background is basically take the uh, um, client object that I've uh, already created uh, further uh, above. It takes this client object and replaces the remove moderator method with a method of its own that um, then um, does bookkeeping how, how many times this uh, method has been called during the test. And then client dispatch gets called. Dispatch in turn results in remove moderator getting called, which is now the replacement method from RSpec. Uh, it um, increases its uh, call counter and um, when this method finally uh, finishes, then we can use have received um, to check how many times remove moderator has been called. Um, uh, we could even actually test for the number of calls, which I don't hear. I just I'm just interested in it being called at all, um, and uh, that's how this works. Allow basically means replace the. Uh, stuff that we call uh, that we name here after receive with your own instrumentation okay um i think oh we'll still have to fix something undefined local me variable or method port Really? Bot memory redis. Uh... Oh yeah. Forgot to. Thanks for the clear explanation. I'm not sure if it was that clear, but I'm happy that uh, at least it sounded reasonable. Okay, we're good. So that should allow us to um, uh, add a Redis host and Redis port to our configuration in our real bot and access a Redis that runs elsewhere. And by default, it'll run on localhost 6379. Okay, I guess time to commit this. Oh, let's uh, also uh, bump the version. 3.2.0. And make a note in the change log. Three, two, oh. New. This release introduces a memory Redis class that allows users to provide their bot with a persistent memory storage again let's close all the editors here just to be sure there's nothing else to commit
time for a proper Let's make sure things work. Break test. Rubocop is happy. RSpec is happy. We are happy. And I just realized I'm already 15 minutes over my time. So let's run, uh, let uh, GitHub Actions run their course. And that's it. So, I guess that's probably it for today. It's a Unix system. I know this. TRN096, thanks for following. Uh, Good thing I am my own boss. Yeah, um, at least in my company I am. I'm probably late for dinner. Um, yeah, uh, if you don't yet follow the stream, as uh, TRN096 now does, please follow. Um, you'll get a notification when I'm, I'll be back. Medak69, thanks for, for, for your message. Enjoying the stream. Yeah, happy to see Project looks super cool. Look forward to seeing it through. Yeah, it's uh, online on GitHub, um, so it's open source. You can uh, always um, um, take a look at things. If you have any questions, um, you can pop by my chat, of course. And if you follow, you get a notification when I'm back. You can also join my Discord server, where we have a Ruby channel uh, that's open for you. We, you can discuss things there. You can ask questions there. I'll be happy to answer them as far as I can. Um, I'll be back tomorrow with a Retro Saturday stream where I'm going back in time to the 70s and uh, we are going to do some basic programming on a PDP-11 mini computer. Uh, until then, uh, or have a, a great weekend. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Drink water. Thanks for watching. Cheers.